Welcome everyone to Science You Had Me At Hello. My name is Melissa Rancourt and I am the founder and board president of Greenlight for Girls, as well as an engineer, an entrepreneur, and an educator. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to today's episode. This broadcast series is designed to help inspire the next generation in science. And how do we do that? By asking awe-inspiring individuals to share their stories. And the word that comes to mind when I think of the speakers today is inclusion. Uh, and this is a, a word that not only is very prominent, especially in business today, because it's a necessity, but also it has a scientific aspect as well. We'll get more to, more to that later. This broadcast is brought to you by Greenlight for Girls, an international organization that works around the world to create hands-on STEM learning for everyone, with particular focus to girls of all ages and backgrounds. And we have a special partner to mention today, and that is AIG. We love our global partners because we get a chance to reach girls all around the world, and AIG has helped us to bring this broadcast to you today. Today in our virtual studio audience, we welcome also you from all around the world with a special shout out to our team on also some G4G ambassadors. And it's amazing, we have at least nine countries, I think, represented today. Venezuela, UK, Ireland, Netherlands, Belgium, Cameroon, Sweden, India, Australia, there might even be more. Today is all about you, those joining us and also our role models and those listening in after the show. <clears throat> We've inv invited onto the stage today four amazing speakers and in a moment they're going to share the spark that inspired them in their STEM journey and we'll learn more about who they are and what they do. So take note, get ready to ask your questions, and now it's my pleasure to introduce and also bring on to the stage our first speaker. So I'd like to introduce and ask Lori O'Neill to come to the stage. She's a passionate diversity professional focused on helping talented people to belong and thrive. And at AIG, she works on increasing the diversity of people who work there and wants to make sure the work culture allows everyone to feel that they can be their self and belong. Uh, Lori, thank you so much for being here today. So next on the stage, I'd like to bring forward Tina Zornazzi. Tina is an international relations expert at the European Commission. Her job is to encourage everyone to work together across borders to solve problems and create more opportunities. And today she combines the passion of getting people together to work on the Green Deal, a project that will make Europe the first carbon neutral continent by 2050. Welcome, Tina. Next on the stage, I'd like to bring Nefele Yeager, our media and communication champion. She uses technology, cloud computing, and data analysis in her daily life in order to promote and talk about big companies such as eBay, Spotify, Sephora, so much we can talk, Sephora, so much we can talk about. Thank you, Nefile, for being here today. And then finally, I'd like to bring forward our speaker, Varid Lobel. She is an insurance expert at AIG. And what's her main strength? Using mathematics, probabilities, and statistics to quantify risk, which is what's called actuarial science. And in 2020, along with 29 other women, she was named Women to Watch by Business Insurance, recognizing her outstanding work in risk management and commercial insurance. Amazing. Thank you, Varid, for being here today. Oh, amazing to have you all here. Thank you so much. Um, what I'd like to do is a moment. I'm going to ask them all about their one moment of inspiration to be in the field that they're in. But first, I just want to mention, so this phrase we talk about, science, you had me at hello, you may recognize it's partly a quote from <clears throat> a movie, but the idea behind it is to share the moments that motivate us to do something, to be part of something bigger, to create, to come up with solutions for people or situations that need us. And the word science means everything from the subject itself to the connection to STEM, to the idea of discovery, curiosity, and possibilities. And this is what connects us to all of us here today. So now let's hear from our special speakers today and ask them about their spark of inspiration. Um, Lori, I'm going to turn to you. So what was that moment, that spark at some point? And when I talk about that, it could be years ago, it could also be yesterday, it happens at any time. 
um, that spark that that um, led you also to, to hear, but just that spark of also that that potential interest in curiosity or STEM. Thanks, Melissa. Um, and because I never obey orders and do one one thing, I think there's probably two things that, that or at least two occasions that I think spark me. The first was being given a chemistry set as a gift one Christmas, um, which I probably didn't use in the traditional way as I used to make various different shades of blood. Um, but it just got me interested in terms of looking at what combined together and how you can make different things. Um, the second thing was was um, that actually I have to admit that I took science at, at high school um, and um, actually failed um, when I first had to choose like my, my, my subject. I, I failed my first year and, um, and, 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 and I'd never failed anything before um, and I, I was kind of ready to give up. And I knew that science was good to have as a for future careers, um, but it wasn't until I went to um, a, a tutor briefly for it and she was she just made it so interesting that I thought actually this is something I could do um, and I got better at it and didn't fail again. Um, so those probably were two moments for me, really. Well, what I love hearing about, too, is that, you know, there are moments, of course, that we have failures, and usually we don't want them, but they happen. But what I love hearing is that you kept on going, right? You, you tried it again, you know? And um, it's all about sometimes being in that right place, having that right person around you, and just keeping on going. Love it. Support's really important. <laughs> Thank you, Laurie. Um, and so Tina, I'm turning it over to you. So if you could share that spark, that moment that perhaps may have led down the path to being here today. Thank you, Melissa. Um, I'm a bit of an intruder because I didn't uh, <laughs> do the science studies that uh, most of you have done, but I did political science, which is another science too. So what led me to that? When I was 18, um, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I knew what I didn't want to do. I didn't want to, or rather the areas that I didn't want to study. But then I happened to be an exchange student abroad. I was uh, actually, I went to the US that introduced me to a whole new area of opportunities and uh, possibilities, uh, including uh, a marriage and <laughs> a lot of other things. Um, and during that exchange program, I met a lot of people from all over the world and we had fantastic conversations. Um, really sharing the diversity and the things that um, uh, that unified us and uh, one of our um, uh, tutors at the time uh, was a wonderful lady and I asked her so what do you do you study because she was a student she said political science and international relations and I said that's what I want to do and that was my moment of inspiration. Uh, I love it but it's also about role models or people we interact with and maybe they're not necessarily like this is a role model but it's it's just having conversations with people around us and someone that you know can can just give an idea that then sparks our own interest to go in that direction i love that and then also though now um with the work that you're doing with the with the green deal especially um this is also all about science in so many ways, right? Yeah, yeah. In fact, I've been dealing a lot with science because before this job, I was doing communication. So I evolved a lot. Huh? It's one thing what you study and one, one thing what you start with. But then you need to know that uh, you, you the world is so, so full of opportunities. And as long as you um, go for them and, and reinvent yourself, you're going to have a lot of fun. So I started working in communications at some point. Um, and I, I realized I was I actually good at that. And well, so I say, <laughs> and then I worked on the areas of uh, fisheries and, uh, and uh, like plastic pollution. And there I worked a lot with uh, scientists and I had to explain what the scientists were telling me in a language that people would actually understand a little bit better. And then that would help them do something about um, the plastics in the ocean, plastics on uh, plastics that we use every day and I'm going to speak a little bit more about it. So I've been dealing with scientists a lot and uh, that has also brought to me a different understanding of what solution science has in our lives and a great respect for all the work they do. I just uh, think that we need to communicate scientific results a little bit better so that we can get more out of it. Yeah, I can only agree. This is fantastic. Thank you, Tina. I'm going to turn this over to Nefele. Tell us about that spark. Um, that's led you, and I think you're you're currently, or just finished your studies, um, and and now in the uh, working environment. So tell us what led you to where you are right now. 
So in retrospect, I think my moment might seem quite trivial because when I was thinking about this, what came to my mind was one time when I was just sat in the living room um, and my parents were complaining about the Wi-Fi not working or having some trivial technical logical problem and I all I did was reboot the wi-fi or something just as basic as that or what seemed basic to me and my parents turn around to me as if I'm some sort of genius and say um wow you're really good at this stuff you should really think about doing something like that and I think even in that moment that was kind of a throwaway comment for them and at the time I didn't really think much of it and I was like no, everyone knows how to do this. This is really basic stuff. Um, but then the more you come to realize and the more you start to actually get out in the world, not everyone knows this stuff. And if you do have that predisposition to kind of have a hack for it, then it's definitely worth just actually exploring that and not taking for granted something that you're just naturally good at. I love that as a story. Now, here's time for the reveal. So is your parent that you were talking about is she in our on our stage by it by any chance she is in fact so she can probably confirm that this happens quite frequently and that i am her um personal iphone helper or support team that's great tina it's lovely that you have the it support at your fingertips whenever you need it and much more she's good with the drills too and a lot more <laughs> That's great. Now, Nephile, we also, we know each other from a way back too, because you had the opportunity to be part of Greenlight for Girls from different times, um, going through high school and things like that. Um, is that something that you reflect upon? Does it seem like so, so long ago or does it seem like yesterday? A bit of both. Um, I remember the Greenlight for Girls events really fondly and I think at the time, you're you're just kind of thinking about so many other things um and to actually be able to remember those and i specifically remember one in the middle school um chemistry lab where we did some crazy robot experiment um that's the kind of thing that you'll just never forget um and i'm so grateful that at the time i was pushed to attend those events um and that is thanks of course to you and obviously my mom who is in the audience and all the powerful women that just in, constantly just told me that I could do whatever I wanted to. Oh, that's fantastic to hear. And I love seeing you now part of our stage um, after seeing you as part of the events um, not so long ago or feels like a lot, it feels like yesterday. Um, Varid, I'd like to turn this over to you about that spark of something along the way that got you to where you are right now. Um, so I think um, inspiration and, and things that got me where I am now, I think it's kind of a circular thing and there are various points, but they, they have common themes. So for me, it's it's people, and I, and I call a certain set of people in my life um, enlightened witnesses, you know, people that see things in you and they give you that feedback um, and they help nurture skills within you that you might not have known you had or that you were different or special in those ways. So I had an incredible maths teacher uh, who I met in high school and um, I think he was just so inspiring and uh, identified talent in each of us and made maths so um, engaging and cool and uh, fun and um, at the school that I went to being good at maths was was actually you know something that everyone was aspiring to because we all wanted to be uh, close to this teacher, um, Mr. Duplessis. So you meet them in your life. He definitely sparked the interest of maths in me. And then what they do is they give you confidence and they build you up. And so then when you are faced with failures, like I was many times at university when I started my degree, um, you know, you can then lean on that. And then it's like Laurie was saying, you know, it motivates you. Those failures can actually motivate you because you think to yourself, I know I can do this. I just need to find a way. Um, and, and so it's, it's those people, it's the failures, and then it's more people along the way that give you opportunities. Um, and, I, and I do find it inspiring that people have given me opportunities, even when I wasn't the natural choice to do um, a job. And when, when people give you that trust, you sort of want to go above and beyond to prove they made the right decision. And so I find that motivating and, um, and, and drives you forward. 
So I would say it's, it's people, it's building up your confidence, facing uh, challenges and obstacles um, and, and sort of learning along the way. Thank you for that. It's, it's amazing the, the power, the good power that people around you can have. You know, yeah. that really, that either, like you said, see something in you that you yeah. either don't see or don't see yet, exactly. um, but then also just boost you to yeah. when you need it, right? Yeah. And need people like that around us at all times, you know, and, and you're lucky to have had that, especially for a subject like mathematics, because unfortunately, we hear too often about the contrary, you know, yeah. that someone discourages as opposed to, you know, rises someone up. Um, and I think that's uh, that's also such an, an important aspect. Uh, now, um, one thing with the people side, it gets me thinking about is that feeling of belonging, as you were talking about, feeling like you're part yeah. of something, which I can't think of something, a better segue into an overall theme that we had in mind for today, which is inclusion. Um, so Vered, maybe continuing on from there, um, is there you know another moment maybe in your life or, or how is that important to you now about the idea of belonging or feeling or making sure people around you feel like they're part of something right i mean um i've i started my career in actuarial science in a very technical field i've now moved over into a more commercial space i'm now doing underwriting and so i have felt like an outsider since january and i've been working in overdrive to prove that i fit in in my new role and that I was the right choice for that role. Um, it's 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 a difficult one. I think your work speaks for yourself, for itself, you know. Uh, and and uh, I think that you will you do eventually break down those barriers just through hard work and, and persistency. Um, I've never personally felt uh, inclusion issues because I'm a female. I think I'm lucky to be in a space where um, there are a lot of women working in the field. So um, I've never felt that that kind of inclusion, inclusion issue, let's say. Um, but from a work perspective, yes, there, there is that constant drive, you know, to, 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 to make sure you feel like you fit in and mm. belong. This is great. I'm going to turn this over to Laurie, because I know, Laurie, this is something that you are talking about, I'm sure, probably every day, talking about diversity and <laughs> yes. inclusion. Um, what are the, some of the things that you're trying to do around you um, to, to affect positive change? I think just thinking of Red's um, comment about, you know, not feeling like, you know, you had a, a you had to, um, you, you didn't, you didn't um, feel out, like an outsider as such. I think I'm kind of paraphrasing you a bit. Um, I think I've always had the, the opposite effect. Um, I've always worked um, since I started in, in, in human resources um, and, and for very male dominated industries. And I think this kind of goes back to, to when, at school where, the people that tend to be the higher up were, were men at my particular school and, and there was always a bit of healthy competition and so I've never shied away from that so actually when I look back at my career it's always been male dominated companies I've always been influencing men um, and, and, um, and, and that, that can, be, can be challenging sometimes to try and kind of get into a mindset that's slightly different from you and different experiences with you so, so a lot of the work that we, we do um, in diversity, equity, and inclusion um, is, is, about, is about culture and is about hearts and minds. Mm -hmm. um, we can give our leaders umpteen stats and they always want more. Uh, they always want to analyze something one way or another way, but actually that isn't going to make the change with them. And, 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 and so sometimes the really important things with us is, 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 is getting something to them that, that, that speaks to them more than that, that that's about storytelling. That's about um, uh, them understanding and getting empathy um, for, for someone who maybe they wouldn't have had a, an experience um, or, or understand, um, you know, it, one of the one of the challenges in insurance is definitely about gender balance um you know we we traditionally haven't been an industry that's that's well gender balanced because of historic um things but we, we we're doing a lot about it um and a lot of work to try to try and, and improve that and people are really open about it um gender balance is maybe slightly easier because most men have a, 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 you know a, 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 a wife or a, a mother or a sister and they've seen their experiences some of the other um, aspects of, of, of diversity can be harder. And so what we do is try to focus on just more a more broader inclusion, inclusion culture um, where people can feel like um, they, they can be their authentic self. So um, that is really different from when I started in the working world where actually 
it, it, you, there was a certain way you had to look and that you conformed and there was a certain way you had to behave. That's really gone over the last few years and more and more so, so that people feel like they can um, be themselves. You know, you, we treat each other with respect. We try and, uh, and, and, and include people as much as possible um, and, and, and that you can be yourself and reveal parts of your person and your personal um, self that maybe we wouldn't have done in the past. And I think that that's really encouraging that a new generation is coming into a working environment that that's like that and very different from when I started almost 20 years ago now. <laughs> encouraging to hear. I mean, we know, of course, there's still things to be done, but the, there is a shift happening, which is lovely to hear. And, and I, I'll shift this also because we're talking about that kind of business environment, but even thinking about it on a societal level, that power, we talked about power of people, but the power of the story and you feel like you're part of it and you can make a difference. It does make me think of Tina. It makes me think of the work that you're doing within the commission and within the Green Deal and, and trying to engage so many voices into all of this. So maybe if you could speak to that. So in, inclusion in the sense of looking at the opportunity for society, what is what are some of the things that, that you're looking to do, you and your team with that? Thanks for that. Um, indeed, uh, for us, uh, the green transition, making uh, Europe uh, the first carbon free continent by 2050 um, is the biggest challenge uh, ever, you know, for a generation. It's completely transformational. But um, what the real challenge is, um, and that's, that's where the inclusion comes in, is that everybody feels they have a role to play in this that this is not something just for governments or just for business or just for whoever, you know, it's something we all have to do together. And this is very um, uh, complex because we don't know exactly what we have to do. And that's where science comes in and we keep going to scientists and tell us, you know, give us your projections, give us your advice, give us, you know, tell us what should be done. And as you know, as scientists, there is a certain level of uncertainty. You can't predict everything, especially the way climate change is happening nowadays, where it's never happened like that before. All these models that are just models based on the past, we don't know how it's going to def definitely project in the future. So you know all that better than me. But what where we come in is that we need to to make sure that everybody feels that is part of this um, transition and everybody knows uh, or feels empowered to, to take some action. And a lot of times we hear from people saying, oh, why should I forgo my, I don't know, plastic straw may not be the right thing or my, my, uh, my trip to wherever by plane. Um, if uh, governments don't do their business, their, their work, or if businesses don't, um, if big corporations are doing this and that, you know, and so everybody's trying to shift blame. And in this case, we really have to, um, to make it uh, kind of come out that everybody has to play a role. And this is, you know, inclusion at, at the societal level, as you said. Yeah, absolutely. It's at the it's the biggest level, right? So we not only have to see ourselves as citizens, as people, as part of the challenge. Part of, I don't hate to say part of the problem, but kind of part of the problem. Um, but more importantly, part of the solution, right? So um, really making sure that all those voices are heard and 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 bringing them as part of it, because together as a big big group, you know, by including everyone and making sure everyone feels included then we will get to a positive change. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Nefile because you had mentioned one thing about taking a look at uh, information because like taking, taking a look at, you know, taking a look at the, um, what the scientists are showing in order to be able to be able to communicate that across and make decisions. And I'm thinking Nefile about the work that you're doing, particularly when it comes to data and how you're looking at information. Um, so tell us a bit of the work that, that you do at this moment. Um, and the types of things that you look at uh, for being able to help other organizations, other companies. Yeah, so it's interesting actually because, so I currently work at a marketing agency and I think one of the ways that marketing is changing nowadays is that it's a lot less coming up with a cute little TV advert that you will play over Christmas and a lot more about actually understanding how users buy online particularly 
um, and how as companies and the clients I look after, how we can use that information to find trends in user behavior, to find trends in what time of day people are more likely to complete a purchase, for example. Um, so what I do is just essentially gathering as much data as I possibly can and then analyzing it and trying to uncover what that data is trying to tell me. And I think what I've realized from that is that there is a reason for everything and you will be able to find trends in everything you do. Um, and it's just so amazing to have that available to you. And it, nowadays, because the world is so technologically advanced, we are able to capture so much different points um, and to the point that it scares a lot of people. Um, but I think me, a part of it, I personally love it. I find it so interesting that we can actually pinpoint exactly why someone has done this and then try to use that information to move it or move uh, move it on for particularly the cl my clients. Uh, I love that because now we're kind of making it another level of that power we have or that we need to harness. So there's power of people around us. There's power of the story, seeing ourselves included into it and the power of information, the power of data and how we use that um, to make a difference. So all those three, all those three elements and more. And I know that everyone would love to hear more from each of you. So what we're going to do now is we're going to do a bit of traveling. Uh, and right now this is our travel opportunity. So I hope you packed a bag. Um, we're going to go pretty far because who knows who might be coming in from whatever country to, to meet you there. We're going to go into actually one breakout room today where you'll have two speakers in each of them. Um, and then that way, each of them, we invite them to share their story a bit more of like what their day in the life is. Um, and then also open it up for questions. So when you go into those rooms, and I'm speaking now to the participants, when you go into the room, turn on your camera so they can see you and you can see them um, and have a great chat together and, and be ready to ask your questions. So three, two, one, we're getting ready to travel. So, um, so we, we're going to have a little bit of time to spend with us. Um, I don't know whether you want to go ver first, Sarah, and give everyone a bit of an overview, sure. and then and then I'll and I'll head on. And then, sure. Uh, now this is a really intimate conversation, so if you want to stop us, ask us questions, put your cameras on and off, um, you can do that, and and, and we'll we'll answer anything you want, almost. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so I'll give you a little bit more background um, about myself. Uh, Laurie and I actually both grew up in South Africa. Um, I grew up in a very small town uh, called Pretoria. Um, and um, while I was at school, I remember in 1994, we had our uh, first democratic uh, election uh, process in South Africa when Nelson Mandela was elected as uh, president. Um, but prior to that time, I mean, we were basically in South Africa, I don't know if Laurie feels the same, but pretty isolated from the rest of the world. Um, there, was, there were a lot of sanctions against South Africa. And, uh, you know, for example, this sounds ridiculous, but we didn't have Zara, we didn't have H&M, we didn't have a lot of brands, big brands that were here or in other places. Or, or TV programs that we weren't yeah. allowed to watch. So yeah, we, 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 exactly. we grew up on, on certain American TV programs and didn't get yeah. to watch British programs. Which yeah, was we had like movie. three channels yeah. and that was it. You know? So I feel like growing up, my life felt so small. And as I grew up, I guess as I got exposure to the bigger world, I just wanted more of it. And I was so motivated to kind of be in a more international environment. And um, so even to this day, traveling and exploring is such a big motivation in my life. I love packing my bags, going somewhere else. Um, just because from South Africa, everything is also so far away, you know, so actually going overseas and going to Europe is so exotic. So for me, that's, that's really a big driver in my life. And I think what pushed me really hard to uh, succeed because I, I wanted to be able to do the things that, uh, you know, I, I, I thought was out there in the bigger world. Um, so, so there's there's a bit of that, um, and so I'll, are we sharing our screen now? Yeah, we're doing. Go for it. A little bit of. Yeah, you okay, can leave this in any way that you want to. Our gallery <laughs> okay. can, you know, bring in all those pictures and stories. That's great. Okay, cool. Okay, so um, I guess this picture over here 
Let me see if I'm sharing my screen properly. Can't see it yet. So ah, there we go. I can see it now. So basically, this picture for me encapsulates travel and encapsulates being away. These are my children. Not all of them. Only three of them. But the other two uh, belong to my next inspiring person. So let me go. So this over here is another. Per this is the, the the mother of the other two children. Let me just see. Let me share this one. Uh, oh, there we go. Okay, so that's her. That's my identical twin sister. And um, she um, has uh, two children. And so she's another big inspiration in my life and another big, I would say, in a way, something that differentiates, I guess, my life from others maybe, in that I had a twin sister growing up. And I think having a twin and having someone that's so close to you um, can, be, can really boost your confidence as well, because you've always got your buddy with you. Um, and so, and then the last uh, one that's uh, in terms of a bit of a, more about uh, me, and this is the guy that was, um, and this was the maths teacher over here, Mr. Duplessis. He was just the most wonderful person who really brought out a lot of a lot of good things, and um, was just a great person to to have in my life. So that's pretty much, uh, you know, a bit of me growing up far away very close to my family who are still who still live in South Africa but motivates me even more to to be able to travel and to see them um, and having good people in my life. Thanks. Laurie, you want to go ahead? Yeah, um, so I'm just going to share my PowerPoint. It'll be a second. I, when we were told to kind of get some pictures together to look at our careers and um, I, I, I was looking at it and thinking gosh it's 20 years how do you really condense 20 years? Um, and, um, and I started, I'll just give you a bit of background. Um, I, did a, um, I did a BSc in psychology um, and, and what really motivated me going past the, the, the bit I gave you in the background was I loved the neuropsychology bit. I loved the way the kind of chemistry worked in the brain and I love finding out about the way people tick. So when I finished university and I actually had a less straightforward route in that I started university in South Africa and then um, moved to the UK at 19, a bit like Verid, I had really itchy feet to travel, um, and and um, and my poor parents, I left them at four days before my 19th birthday. Looking back now, I can think how crazy that was. But at that age, all I wanted was a bit of adventure and to go somewhere new. Um, and 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 so I, I moved to the UK and um, started working, and then um, started my degree uh, in psychology, um, carrying it on in the UK. Um, and, 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 and realized that actually um, it was pretty hard to keep up with, with um, studying overseas fees and trying to work part-time to support myself and things. So I ended up finishing off my degree um, uh, um, through correspondence. So um, actually I had lots of kind of uh, fits and starts. And so I just wanted to kind of illustrate that it's not always straightforward and not to give up if you do have these things that happen because um, I, I, you know, I, I took longer than I probably would have, but actually I now have two degrees. Um, I have a, a really good job and I think the way that I got there matters little. It's more the kind of the journey and what I got from it. And, and similarly in my, in my career, um, when, when, you, when, you, when you look at it, although I've always worked in human resources, I've done lots of different jobs in human resources. And, um, and, and when I, at the time, I probably found it less easy for like other people would say, what are your five-year plans? And I didn't really know. And I think um, all I knew was that I was always up for trying something new. And I was, uh, would always try things out. And, and actually, so, and when I look back now in retrospect, I say some of the things, if I hadn't done those, I probably wouldn't be in the role that I did now. For example, um, I started with a, with a, a storage company and, um, and, I, I, and I did a, an HR um, role with them where I kind of did a bit of everything, which gave me a really good overview of all the different things I could do in, 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 in that role. And then I started doing like an operational training role, which then took me on to my next company, which was a financial services firm, where I used to organize training and development um, um, for them. But the fact that I was able to deliver training and get that experience has really helped me in the role that I do now. Um, and, 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 um, and then um, I worked for a, a transport company and, and that was very science based, lots of engineers, lots of people that, that, that had, uh, had different careers. And, and I supported like um, 
a corporate company, a part of a company. Um, I supported at one point maintenance people. So I was down the side of a track talking to them about different HR issues and, and they were in their hard hats. I was in signal boxes. Um, I also um, helped support uh, um, a, a, a program down on a naval base for people that were trying to do their science through an apprenticeship scheme. So I've seen lots and lots of different ways that people have got to where they are now. And, and I think the reason I'm, I'm raising this is that, um, is that I think one of the things I'd say is, you know, science is a great found, uh, foundation and you can do so many different things from it. And I'll probably talk about that a bit more towards the end. Um, but in terms of my career, I kind of wanted to show you a few bits in terms of some of the opportunities when you are open to trying things out. And, um, and, 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 and sometimes I had to be a little bit pushed and encouraged. So the first two pictures that you can see at the top of the screen are back in 2014. Um, and that's, uh, again, with my itchy feet, I was given an opportunity at the time I was doing a project um, role, which was a change project for, for the UK and acting as a business partner for them. And it was a bit of a quiet period. Um, and um, we were setting up a financial center in, um, in, in, in India at the time um, as, a, as a service center. And they, and they had some issues in terms of working with some of the external company and bringing people from working for them to working for us. And so I got an opportunity to go out there for a month to India um, and, and, and work in India and, um, and get to know it. And that was a brilliant opportunity to see and, and started probably my interest from living in South Africa to living in the UK. I had another point lived in America and did some work there. This was another continent and another culture where I got an opportunity to kind of live and work there, albeit only for, for, for a month. Um, but to see what it was like in the working environment, to, to see the differences in terms of how you had to deal with people um, and, 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 to, and also to learn that you should not eat curry uh, for three meals a day when you're not used to it because you have really awful heartburn. Um, and the, other bit, <laughs> the other photos um, are just a little bit about um, you know, moving from a role where maybe I was outside of London to being in London was really exciting to start. Um, and that bottom picture there is just after I had my first child or my only child, um, and I got to go as part of a, um, a, 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 an, an, an inclusion um, initiative to go and into the House of Commons. So um, that's me in Parliament um, being able to take my child in there and, 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 and as one of many mothers. Um, the next slides I've just got is just to kind of bring you more up to my current role um, where, I, where I do a lot on diversity and inclusion. Um, and this is uh, um, it shows you a little bit of some of the programs you do. So as part of my role, I run some of the development program for underrepresented um, um, uh, employees uh, to help develop and, and, and progress our, our next, um, next streamline of leaders. And this particular, the two slides at the top, um, were um, the, the, the program that we kicked off in Brussels last year um, for our women leaders. Um, and actually, I not only got to organize it and run it for the whole 12 months that we ran it, but I also got to be part of it, which was great. It was just at the time when I was taking on this role and it was like absolutely perfect opportunity to be able to do this. And, and I think this is really useful to, to, to illustrate because I, I had done, a, a very, as I said, various different HR roles. But when I was given this role, this was, um, this was um, uh, given to me as an opportunity. And I said, I can't do this. I don't have this background. Um, and it was through support that I had two leaders that said to me, yes, you can do this, that I realized this is something I'm passionate about. Um, and the bottom ones are just um, showing you that, you know, I have a wider region of about 16 different countries. And this was me going to Dubai last year, just before Christmas, miss those times, to be able to do some, some, some training with the, with the staff members there. So just, and one of the people I work with on diversity and inclusion there. So we had a, we had a really great time. So yeah, just a, a few examples here of, of, of some of the things you can get involved. That's amazing. That was amazing to hear both of your stories. Thank you so much for sharing. We just have like uh, one minute uh, oh, left. Yeah, sorry, I, I think maybe Julia has a question for you or maybe Tammy. Okay. <laughs> um, I, would, I would have a question if we, I don't know if you have time, but um, it's, if you're working in a team, uh, on a team project, what's the best way to make sure everyone feels included? And if someone looks like they're feeling excluded, how can you make sure, how can you make them feel included? Great. Sure. I think um, I'm quite conscious of that uh, coming from a, a, lot of, a lot of actuaries have a very bad reputation of being extremely quiet. Um, and so I think in, it, it's, it's about understanding different people 
and how they work best. You know, it would not be good for me to call on someone in a big meeting room that I know is quite shy and difficult for them to express themselves in a big setting. Some people work really well in those settings and they love speaking out in a boardroom, but um, you, you have to tailor your approach to really extract everyone's contribution. So what I wanted to accomplish with this breakout room is just to share a little bit about how I got to where I am today because I can, um, I was probably in the spot that a lot of you guys are not so long ago. So as Melissa mentioned, I uh, finished my studies about three years ago. And within that time, I've actually moved around quite a bit. So um, I just wanted to take you through quickly how I got to where I am. So I actually, so I went to university in the UK um, and then decided that I liked that. It was fun, but I kind of want to also try living somewhere else. So what I did is I actually did a study abroad pro program, which took me to Hong Kong. And I had an amazing six months there where I got to not only immerse myself in the Hong Kong culture, but also got to travel. So that was um, quite fun for me. Um, so after my stint in Hong Kong, I came back to the UK, but still quite eager, decided that I wanted to take the opportunity to take a placement year, which is um, part of the degree I was doing in business, which allows you to work for a full year at a company. And what I did is actually I worked at Oracle, which is a huge IT company. They are primarily focused on business to business operations. So most people don't really know about them unless you're within the industry or within the working world. Um, and that was a huge step for me. Um, I absolutely loved it. And I think I would highly recommend anyone to take that opportunity if you get it, because having the option to work at a company as a placement student, you've always got a bit of an excuse to, to use your intern label to your advantage, because you can essentially ask for whatever you want. And people are so eager to give you the, a positive experience that they'll probably give it to you. So what that meant for me, it was that I was able to um, join one of the really cool initiatives that Oracle had started a, around Internet of Things, which was uh, demoing how they were using Internet of Things in for Oracle and how they can use the for their clients. And I got to go around the UK and actually also got to travel to the Netherlands and to Ireland to showcase the capabilities that Oracle has using IoT. So that was amazing, which was something that I actually knew nothing about. And by the end, I was able to stand up in front of a group of 50, 50 year old men and talk about it um, for 20 minutes. So, um, and then once that came to a conclusion, I went back to university for my final year and then eventually moved down to London um, where I wanted to try my hand at working in a startup and see what that environment was like compared to working in a big organization. Uh, so I started at a fairly small marketing agency. We were only about 10 people. Um, and that's how I started getting into marketing as opposed to focusing only on Oracle and like technology. Um, but I've managed to somehow find links between those two, which does sound unusual, but what you come to find is that you'll find tech and data and anything you do. And the more you're able to be able to read that data, the more it comes to your advantage. So that's what I was started saying previously about how I use data every single day. Um, there's always at least one Excel tab open on my browser. Um, and to me, it's like creating a story from all the different data points. So that's a really quick summary of how I got here. Um, and with that, I'll pass over to my mother. <laughs> Thank you, Nefeli. <laughs> Thank you, Nefeli. Um, so um, I 
would uh, focus because I have a lot more years to cover, so I don't want to take uh, <laughs> hours. So I'll focus on two um, two the, uh, parts of my career. Let's say the beginning and where I'm I now. So I started off actually. I said that I I studied um, political science and international relations. And my dream job became a reality and I actually started working at the United Nations and my first post was in uh, Burundi in Africa. So this was an experience that I had quite at a young age and it was um, fantastic in terms of discovering a new continent, a new world, a new um, the, the work, of course, that was extremely interesting, the whole different um, the diversity of, of people working at the UN because you have people from all over the world and also of course the problems that um, were uh, existing uh, in the country, the, um, the economic issues, the social health, all the other issues that were, were um, uh, we were there to help with and then eventually even political, there was a coup d'etat so there were a lot of things happening even the time I was there. But um, overall, the uh, time that I spent at the UN, also later on in New York and dealing with other uh, countries in Africa, were a fantastic experience in terms of um, understanding, you know, where the world can come together and how uh, important the role of the UN has been all these years in, in trying to keep peace in trying to solve global problems by bringing countries together. So uh, from the UN, I came back to um, Europe more for personal reasons. And uh, my uh, daughter, Nefeli, was uh, one year old at the time when we moved to Europe. And, um, we, and I, I ended up working for another international organization because again, I guess this attracts me, um, working together to, to solve problems. I think this is, um, I guess, the... Um, the the constant thing that I've been doing and um, in the uh, European Union where I'm now um, working uh, we have been uh, bringing together the nations of, of Europe to also to overcome the 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 wars that brought about the European Union that was one of the reasons the European Union um, was uh, created um, and uh, over this time, there was closer and closer cooperation in many areas. And now when we look at issues like climate change and what we do, um, for instance, uh, in terms of uh, the pandemic uh, and how do we deal with the uh, coronavirus in Europe, uh, so much hinges on uh, countries working together and having all these channels that we create to work together effectively and to come together to solve problems that I could not imagine a world without those um, international organizations and without the, 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 the work we do. And of course, there's always things that we could do better, but I try to look at the things from a positive side and uh, appreciate all the, the good work that's, uh, that's happening. Oh, thank you, Tina, that's great. Um, Marianne, do you have any questions? I'm sure that you are in the right breakout room just for the, I know Marianne a bit, so I know what she's interested in. So Marianne, feel free to ask questions or because you ask some questions later, maybe you want to keep them. So you tell me and I have a few too, so you do as you want. Um, yeah, I do, I will ask a few uh, more questions later, but I, I guess one that just popped to my mind, um, is because uh, Nafel, you were mentioning how you were presenting to a room of like only, you know, middle-aged men, which kind of um, so it kind of made me think um, about whether both of you have encountered difficulties uh, in your field, you know, talking about inclusion and diversity as as women, and how did you overcome that? And maybe I don't know if you two already had this conversation before, but do you feel like there is a difference between when you started working, Tina, and when uh, you, you start working, her. Yeah, I mean, I can start. Um, I obviously don't know how it compares to when my mom was. But for me, I especially working in an extremely male dominated environment, such as Oracle, um, I was 
but mainly on the sales team as well, which um, meant that I was in a team of, I think, 12, and I was the only girl, um, and I was an intern, so I was significantly younger than all of them. Um, what I would say with that is that it's crazy how quickly you adapt to situations. Um, and for me, I think I am quite an adaptable person. So I'm quite good at trying to, to understand what people are like and seeing how I can make myself like communicate with them. So by the, by a couple of weeks in, I was already like finding myself asking them about like their children and that sort of thing. And I mean, in that sense, it's funny how quickly you can build that sort of personal rapport with them. Um, but I mean, there's always going to be kind of those situations where I, of course, I've experienced times where I've said something and I was questioned, whereas if a male counterpart had said that, they definitely wouldn't have had that reaction. Um, yeah, I mean, Tina, how do you think it is different now than to when you were my age? It's different. <laughs> So, uh, Marianne, one of my um, experiences, and I can say that I've had many bad experiences, but one of my experiences when I was uh, freshly had freshly arrived in uh, in Burundi, and I was sent to a meeting uh, with the ministerial committee to to speak about the projects and what we were doing there, and I entered. Um, inside uh, the room and the conference room and there were all these much older people and uh, and the minister turns around he says why does the un send the secretary here and uh, i was like uh, i'm not the secretary i'm the new policy officer and they looked at me like i was you know extraterrestrial <laughs> But uh, I sat there and I did what I have to do. And after that, nobody ever questioned me again um, in that context. But um, now looking back at it, um, things have changed a lot and nobody would question that uh, in an obvious way, but there's so many other subtle ways. And because I'm a manager and I, I deal with a lot of different kinds of people and I recruit people and I, I also, um, see how people um, sell themselves, market themselves uh, for a recruitment. I've seen so many differences between uh, men and women when they um, come and they want a position. And uh, there was one position I was recruiting for, and uh, I had uh, two men come and, uh, and say, oh, that job description, that was written for me. It's exactly my profile. I'm perfect for that. And I was really, and then the woman who uh, came and interviewed said, well, I have some parts of this, but not maybe as much that you would like in the other parts. So I realized that so many women, um, so many times women undercut themselves, even now, you know? So for me, this shows that there's still a lot of things that we can do to make women more confident, more assertive, and to to speak up for themselves and this is what my advice would be if you were ask, if you were to ask me oh brilliant thank you that's a great answer thank you hello everyone everyone's back i'm going to ask our speakers to come to the stage um, I hope you all had a great time getting to know uh, more about our speakers and perhaps their day in the life or whatever other questions might come up. So we're going to go straight now to the next part, which is we're going to bring forward one of our G4G ambassadors um, to ask you a question. And our G4G ambassadors are in different parts of the world. Um, after that, we're going to dive and see what's cooking up in our G4G lab. And there's one experiment in the lab we haven't done yet, and that is cloning. But if we were to do cloning, our next ambassador, she's gonna be first on the list. So I'm gonna ask Marianne to come forward. Uh, Marianne um, has been with G4G for so long and we won't let her go. Um, and we love to have her join our events. And she is an international relations student. So very connected to you, Tina. Um, passionate about feminism, music and learning. And Marianne, I think you've got a question for everyone here. So go for it. 
Yes, I do. Uh, first of all, thank you everybody for taking some time to give us some really interesting insights. Um, so my question is that I've, I've noticed that there's a lot of things that are written about practicing inclusion, um, you know, just theoretical things about best practices and, and how to include people in businesses, etc. Um, but I think there's quite probably quite a big difference between theory and practice. Um, so I was wondering if this is something that you've noticed in your line of work um, and if it's maybe like brought up some interesting challenges for you and if yes, how did you overcome that? I see Laurie smiling. So I'm gonna to turn to Laurie for see if something comes up. I, I was actually just um, messaging Vered because we had just started her talking about exactly that in our breakout room and, and it ended. So maybe maybe it's a good time for her to cover that bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got that question in our breakup room. How do you include people? How do you make sure you're including them? And I was saying uh, to Julia that um, essentially, from in my experience, I think um, it's, it, it, I don't think I've ever studied anything about inclusion. I don't think I've ever seen anything theoretical, let's say. Um, but I do think with, with like a little bit of experience, you just realize that Every, the people are so different and, and, and they work best in different environments. And so um, some people work best by writing them an email and then they respond by email. Some people work best by giving them a phone call and having a chat. Other people, it's a one-to-one. -one. Some people love being in a big open space and, and talking and presenting, you know? So I think it's, it's knowing who the people are, knowing how they can contribute in the best environment and collating and collaborating, you know, bringing it all together and listening, being a really good listener, because you know what you have to say, you know what you're thinking, but uh, approaching other people, like, what do you have to say? What do you have to contribute? And drawing that out, I think, uh, how, is, is how you probably include people. Great. Thank you for that. Um, Marianne, I think you also have another question. Yes, I did. I have a question specifically for uh, Tina. So in your work on the Green Deal, um, what strategies do you use to make sure that everybody's uh, voice is heard? Because, of course, it's maybe more e easier to include political or stakeholders like corporation, etc. But how do you make sure that, for example, small scale farmers uh, are also being included in, in those conversations? That's an absolutely great question. And um, in fact, we uh, always look at um, what we call segmenting our audiences and um, just dividing them into different categories uh, based on what they're interested in. So uh, what I would tell an 18 year old girl who's been protesting uh, in the streets uh, in the Fridays for Future is not the same as what I would tell um, a 50 year old man who um, does not really think very much about the environment because he has just lost his job and uh, he's thinking about, you know, how he's going to make uh, the, the rent for the next month, you know, there's very different situations and um, we really need to take into account that um, and to um, diversify also the messages that we have uh, depending on, on uh, people's uh, uh, individual situations. But in order to have a, a broader impact with what we do, we, we try to look at people who are not uh, necessarily the most ardent environmentalists, people who are really already uh, quite um, um, knowledgeable and aware and already doing things because uh, of course they can always do more but we think that they can do that on their own um, and we're not looking at those who are climate deniers who or who say I don't care about the environment we're trying to find the people in the middle where we can have an effect by um, giving them enough reasons on why they should care why uh, caring and doing something uh, around you know the green deal um action plan uh, which uh, involves changing the way we eat changing our transport changing uh what we buy uh, all these changes in our in our daily lives um if we can make those changes or we can convince them that there are benefits beyond it's not just the environment there are other benefits too there are health benefits there are economic benefits there are a lot of other things then um we have a better chance to to convince uh 
um, people to, to change their behaviors because ultimately that's what we all need to do to, to make this happen. Oh, great, thank you so much, Marianne, for the excellent questions. Um, it's lovely to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Um, and talking about inclusion, especially with these questions that Marianne brings forward, I'm actually now curious to see what's going on in the G4G lab, um, and especially where science might take us next in this um, inspiration. So with this, I'm going to invite the team to give us an, an inside look into the lab right now, while uh, we can all go to the side and turn off our video um, and get ready to see what's going on. When we hear the word inclusion, it may bring to mind the way diverse, unique talents and people can come together with equal opportunity and empowerment. We also see that science benefits from diversity and inclusion. We can think of inclusion as a necessity that helps our results become more complete. Even if we only exclude one person, talent, or variable, our experiment may fail to achieve the desired results. Coincidentally, the word also has a special meaning in mineralogy, or the study of minerals. It describes a material trapped inside a mineral. In this case, inclusions can reveal significant insights about the world where that rock was created, just as inclusive communities and science reveal the strength of diverse and unique members. With inclusivity as our inspiration, let's get experimenting. In this experiment, we see that the science of diffusion unites different substances in one shared area. By moving substances from an area of high to low concentration, we see how the science brings together diverse and separated colors into one shared area of equal representation. In life, when we include everyone, we can create much more beauty, diversity, and we generate so many more ideas. When we combine yeast and sugar, we create a fermentation process. As a fungus, yeast will eat and break down sugar, so when these two combine in the bottle, the resulting gas is carbon dioxide, which blows up our balloon. You can see by our examples that if we include all the materials together just right, the balloon blows up. But if we miss just one variable like the sugar, the balloon only inflates just a little. We can make water bend thanks to the charge of the molecules. Normally, water has a neutral charge, meaning an equal number of positive protons and negative electrons. When we rub the balloon on our hair and hold it close to the water, the water's protons move towards the balloon's negatively charged electrons. The different charges attract each other, much like how we need different people and perspectives to create balance in communities. Thanks for watching, and we can't wait to see you on the next episode of Science You Had Me At Hello. I love always seeing what's going on in our G4G lab and here taking the theme of inclusion and bring it both from a societal and a scientific aspect. I invite our speakers to join us one last time because I've got one more question for you before we go. 
So great to see everyone back onto the stage. All right, I usually end with this very last question, um, and it's about thinking about the world that we have in front of us. You know, we've been talking about inclusion today. We're also talking about role models, um, the power of people, the power of uh, information, uh, the power of story. Um, I'm going to ask this really, really big question and just I, I would love to hear what words you have. And, and I know I'm not the only one because there are a lot of people who need to hear things at different times, particularly right now what's going on. So if you know what would be one wish that you'd have for the world uh, at this moment, this is my question to you. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you first, Nephile, um, and ask you what is your wish for the world um, at this moment? Yeah, we are living in very crazy times right now. Um, and I think the world has come a long way, it's something we're talking about in our breakout session as well. Um, and there has been a lot of progress. And I think that's important to remember that. Um, and we've achieved a lot since um, since even when maybe my mom was my age. Um, but of course, there's still a lot um, that we have to acknowledge that there's still a lot of substantial gender inequality um, around the world just in general, but also particularly in these fields that we're looking at um, in STEM. So I think what um, I really hope to see is that we can continue to just empower the women around us and to bring each other up so that we can stay curious and know that we if someone, if a guy can do it, then so can we. Um, and if we can address these inequalities, then overall our society is gonna be in a better place um, in, from climate change all the way to technological disruption. So that's what I hope to see. And I hope that we can soon get out of this pandemic. Thank you so much, Nephile. I couldn't agree more. I'm going to turn this over to your mom. Uh, so I'm going to ask Tina the same thing about the wish for the world or inspiring words for, for the future generation. What comes to mind? Uh, Tina, I'd love to hear from you. First, I want to say how proud I am of uh, my daughter because I don't get to say it very much uh, these days, uh, especially on Zoom and to other pe in front of other people. And I also want to say that when she was younger and I was uh, talking to her about um, equality and about uh, being a woman and, you know, the things that I had learned uh, from, you know, a bit the harder way, she was like, Mom, come on, don't tell me about these things. The world is different now and uh, there, we're equal and there's no, no difference between us and, and, and guys. And I was like, really? Okay. And, um, and then it took a few years for her to enter, you know, the various areas that she, um, she had more experiences in and to see the subtleties in which um, we're still not equal. And if I look at the, some of the projections, I think that they uh, say that for women to reach equality in Europe, which is one of the most equal um, continents in the world, it's going to take a hundred years. So my wish for the future is to make this in a lot less so that Nefeli can be telling her daughter that there was a time that this period was 100 years and now it's none. So that's my wish. Oh, I love that wish. Thank you so much, Tina, for sharing that. Um, I, I very much wish the same. So with both of us wishing it and probably all of us here today, then I'm sure it's bound to come true, right? Um, so with that, I'm going to turn this over to Lori. Uh, Lori, if you could share your wish for the world, inspiring words for the, the next generation, as, as we say. To be honest, Austin, Effley and Tina, I don't think I could really say anything more about my wish for the world. I mean, that they, they echo exactly the kind of things that I would have said, really. But what I probably would say is more the, the wish for the generation. Um, and, and I'm thinking more um, from, a, from a people who are listening on this call um, is, you know, think of, of, of what you could do in the future from with, with, with science education, STEM educations, science, technology, you know, engineering and maths are amazing um, grounding for any career. And I think what you'll see from here is that you, you never know which way it's going to take you. But having that, that, that backing, having that um, great logical thought, having that good training um, uh, uh, will stand you in amazing uh, instead. And it makes such a difference in terms of the choices you make early on. Um, what we found through some of the, the research that's been done around fi uh, the financial um, uh, um, 
a benefit or equality is that the choices that you make uh, in your school subjects and then I go into um, post school and, and, and university make a huge difference in terms of how you then enter the market of the workplace um, and, 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 and can really determine your financial future throughout your, 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 your life, which sounds really big. But all I can say is that that's a really easy decision now and that, you know, by making a decision to go through the STEM sides of things, you open up a huge world of opportunities. And the other thing I just say is be curious and ask lots of questions because uh, one of the things I, I think can reflect back is that I was much more likely to ask questions early on in my career and, and, and people are happy to answer them. So don't stop doing that um, because actually you, that's how you really do learn. Oh, thank you so much, Laurie. And, I, and, and also such a great sentiment that, that staying curious and asking questions, that doesn't stop. That continues on because we is we're always evolving and learning and trying new things as well. So thank you for that. And and now to Varid. So um, thinking about especially inspiring the next generation and also that wish that you would have. Um, what comes to mind? So my wish is, I mean, this this pandemic has blessed us with an opportunity to really test remote working and flexible working. And I know it's very topical. Um, and I just think we're actually really blessed that we've been thrown into this. Everyone's working from home. It is possible. It's possible to collaborate. It's possible to do your job and be productive even at home. And I think that I, I just wish that and I hope that when things go back to normal as they were, that we, we still remember the lessons we learned from the pandemic around how we work. Um, because I think if, if with, with the equality and, and getting women into the same kinds of positions and giving women the same kinds of opportunities, I don't think you can um, necessarily get there with, without the flexibility. And, and I think if, if, if more people had that even playing field of, I work from home once a week or I, I work four days a week and, and it's more shared between men and women regardless, I think that that will that will push uh, the equality front, which, which, which are, uh, is, is the overall wish, but hopefully the pandemic put, puts us into a good, good place for that. Um, and then just one more thought around the general, for the generation in general, um, is that I hope that, well, I, I guess I think about something that I, I maybe accepted a little bit later on, which is, um, it, it was from a book that I read uh, by Ryan Holiday, and the title of the book is the obstacle is the way. And I wish I read that book long ago uh, because the overall idea of that book is that um, life is going to be challenging. There are going to be challenges along the way in whatever you do. So I think the sooner people accept that as part of their experience, embrace the challenge, embrace the difficult obstacles, those are the things that you're gonna learn the most from and you will come out a better person so don't don't be defeated and don't be um, don't let those obstacles uh, you know get in your way. Just tackle them head on, uh, one step at a time. I love that as well because the the reality is is that we are presented with obstacles every single moment. You know, and we might feel that they lessen over time, especially when you have them early on. But they don't. They actually usually get worse, but they get more. And we need to actually create more of that um opportunity inside us to keep on going through and also as you talked about before too Verit, is look to the people around us to help us through as well yeah yeah thank you all four of you um, for these last words of of inspiration and hope to others for taking a look at what's going on now for the positive of the future um, but then also for your time here to share your stories this is so important and such an important aspect, especially to our program, Science You Had Me at Hello. So with that, we're going to end for today. Um, and, and, and basically, this is going to be something that I know we're all going to look back on and be able to be inspired by all the words that you say. So I wish you all a wonderful evening um, and we'll see you the next time. So thank you and good evening. Thank you, bye. Bye. Bye everyone. <laughs>